Welcome to the Asking Why podcast. I'm your host, Clint Davis. I'm a marriage and family therapist and licensed professional counselor trained in trauma and addiction. The Asking Why podcast is for anyone on a journey of healing and restoration. If you are searching for answers to life's questions and want to learn more about root causes from a psychological and theological mix, this show is for you. In this podcast, myself and a co-host from Clint Davis Counseling and Integrative Wellness will interview guests on a wide range of topics in order to get down to the heart of the problems facing our world and understand why things happen and how to change the world and ourselves for the better. Want to learn more tips and tricks to living a healthy lifestyle? Visit us at Clint Davis Counseling and Integrative Wellness on Facebook and Instagram. If you want to meet our staff or book a speaker, go to clintdaviscounseling.com. Thanks for listening and be sure to subscribe today. All right, Asking Why, episode 29. We're almost to 30, so I'm excited about that. Um, we have Denisa Walker um, on our podcast today from Learning RX. And Denise and I have been friends for a while, so welcome, Denisa. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Glad to have you. Um, super excited about the talk today. Um, so we're going to be talking about emotional intelligence, IQ, helping kids and adults, you know, kind of educate themselves on what that is. I think a lot of times people think they know what that is. We, right. We've talked about IQ forever you know, but we don't really, as a culture, deal with that often. Right. Um, it's kind of a niche that you have here at Learning RX <laughs> that I love. Um, and so, yeah, so let's talk about a little bit. Tell us first, um, what is Learning RX and uh, what do you do? So, Learning RX is, uh, is a franchise, but uh, I own the local franchise. And what Learning RX does is we do one to one brain training. So, we identify the underlying skills in the intelligence that are keeping us held back mm -hmm. from being our, our full self. And we actually intervene, we test first to identify those, and then we do one to one brain training so that kids, adults can come up in their skill set to achieve what they want to achieve in life. Awesome. Yeah. Y'all have a great setup. I've visited a couple of times <laughs> and I love the different rooms and resources and uh, games that you have. Right. So that's awesome. So who would be kind of a good client for that? Well, we start at age four, we go all the way through adults. And so it really is the person who feels like they're not reaching their full potential, no matter what their age is. So it could be someone who's struggling with a, a learning difference. It could be someone who's needing to take a test, like a lot of people are, you know, it's been a while since I went back to school and I need to, you know, up my game. Um, so that happens. We have some adults who come for that. People who are struggling with dementia um, that need to get their skill sets back or just feel a little bit of weakness happening in their life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I recently just had surgery. So after surgery, sometimes you have some fog that happens and you want to refine that and bring your skill set back up because you've had a lot of anesthesia yeah. or chemotherapy, uh, those types of things. So it really is a gamut of a lot of people. Um, I would say most of our clients tend to be those who have a definitive learning disability, uh, attention deficit, dyslexia, dysgraphia, that really need intensive intervention. Mm -hmm. Um, in the summer, a lot of people just want a little uh, pickup, uh, especially after COVID, uh, with a lot of gaps that have happened uh, over the COVID slide or yeah. the COVID melt or whatever they're calling it now. Yeah. Tell me, <laughs> um, what do you think about, what have you seen from the education in the kids and their, their struggles with COVID and being in the pandemic? So one thing that we're seeing a phenomenal amount of, and this is in adults and children, especially um, our 15 to 19 year olds, uh, surprisingly, uh, we're seeing a lot of kiddos who have a deficit in their auditory uh, skill set. So they have not been able to really get that skill set where it needs to be in that listening. And as you as you head off to college, you need to be able to listen, to lecture, to be able to take that information in. And there was a lot of that missed because they missed the classroom. Um, they did a lot of things virtually. Yeah. So there is a, a big gap that's happening with our auditory processing issues because of mask, mm -hmm. you couldn't hear the sounds. So couldn't we have a lot lips. of our readers, yeah. uh, early readers whose sounds were completely lost. So we have a big gap with our early readers, our seven to nine year olds who are not reading as they should be. Wow. So um, we have a lot right now at our center who are really there for reading intervention at all ages. Yeah. 
Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. What Anything else that particularly stands out to you about kind of the consequences of COVID? I think the consequences of COVID affected us in, you know, definitely in our auditory processing. And I think it affected us a lot with their ability to accumulate information and link it. So in our brain, the fancy word, the schemata of mm-hmm. the brain, you, you need experiences to connect a lot of those things. And a lot of our kids and our adults missed some of those experiences that helped build that schema. And so when they're reading or they're taking in new information, there's kind of a, a gap there of linking that information. They missed field trips. They missed, you know, good experiences that would uh, help them with that long-term memory connection. And so there's been some weaknesses that have uh, started because of that, that need you yeah. know, intervention. That's interesting. I mean, we know that, you know, that's the crazy part about all of this is there's so many consequences of this last you know, 14 months or whatever it's been now. Um, so, okay. So what do you do with somebody? Like, what would they do if they come in and they're saying, you know, they're like, yeah, my kid's been out. I don't really even know if it's affected them. They're getting back to school. Right. What would be some things that they would come and do with you that would benefit that? Well, the first thing we would see is where that weakness was. And then we would partner them with a one-to-one brain trainer and they would work deliberately on those exercises to rebuild that skill. So if it's a listening comprehension issue, they would be working on listening comprehension specifically, um, doing exercises that are that, and then they would have home training exercises that they do also to build that. Mm-hmm. Interestingly enough, a lot of, um, you would think with the more time at home, that parents and the interaction was better because they had more time at home (laughs) and it's much reversed because if I was one mom with five kids, you know, I didn't have the ability to, I had too much on my plate and I was trying to stack these kids and do that at home. And so it really disrupted the schedule and the home life and the integration uh, of, of things in the brain. So that's one of the things we've worked a lot on is the integration, helping them to be able to integrate the emotional aspects with the intelligence aspects, because those factors play so hard against each other. Mm-hmm. And what you, a lot of times your emotion impacts the way that you see the world and the way that you interpret um, reading, um, you know, the experiences that you have. Right. And so that's been a big factor that we've had to really up our game on, yeah. uh, you know, in doing that is that sometimes you spend time being as much a counselor as you are a brain trainer, uh, because you're having to help kids talk through some of these circumstances that have happened and really traumatize them. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, we've talked about this before, but you know, emotional intelligence, which you're going to dive into today and, and kind of help me and people understand, you know, that's something that, um, I think is sorely lacking in our culture in general, Mm -hmm. um, that we haven't really, I mean, emotions haven't been a big thing that we've had the privilege of dealing with as we've been in survival for thousands and thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And now that we're in this new state of comfort, quote unquote, um, You know, we need to, you know, be emotionally intelligent. We have the capacity to do it. Kids can learn uh, way earlier than we think they can, um, and yet we're not doing it. And then we're wondering why they're not having success, which we'll talk about later. Like, what does success look like for you? What is, you know, what's the problem? So that's helpful. What, so tell me your story a little bit. What, who is Denisa and how did she get into brain training and learning RX and all this kind of stuff? It's really a crazy story. Uh, And it has a big emotional factor to it. Um, I was uh, headed to be a doctor. That was my uh, career field, my plan. Okay. And um, are you from here? I'm actually from East Texas. Okay. Um, and a Texas raised, born and raised girl. Um, married a Louisiana boy. That's okay. how I ended up in Louisiana. Nice. Um, you know, because God is such a big factor in my life. I, you know, that's uh, when I was 16, I was called um, to the mission field to a French speaking country dealing with children with learning disabilities. And God's sense of humor is hilarious um, (laughs) that I ended up in Louisiana working with special needs kids uh, and adults. But um, when I was uh, first, first year of college, my brother was murdered. Mm. And uh, when he was murdered, my parents, my dad's a pastor, um, it sort of, uh, it really offset both of my parents. And so I kind of had to step up to the plate uh, for my sister and my brother and helping them um, handle the emotional experience. Yeah. Is uh, it your older brother? Well, I'm the oldest. Okay. So he was the oldest male, but he you. was he was actually third in line. And what was his name? Micah Drew. Okay. Uh, precious young man. Um, and uh, 
So he was murdered by uh, someone in our church who he went to Christian school with. Um, during the school day, they had gone uh, over to this kid's house, and the kid shot him to see what it felt like to kill someone. Wow. So no sense, you know, and it's really hard to manage that. Um, lots of emotions, you know, in that. But my sister and my younger brother, um, it was my sister's senior year, April of her senior year, and so I'm helping her study for finals, and she can't read. And it just blew my mind because I had been reading since three. And I was like, what? Anyways, long story short, um, that's when I kind of discovered that, you know, dyslexia was a thing. Mm -hmm. And it had no impact on her intelligence or her beauty or anything. And my younger brother also had the same problem. And the comment was, well, you and Micah Drew were the only readers. And I was like, what are you talking about? You know, so I went and talked to my mom and she said, I've never read a book in my life pridefully and I was like what you know it just blew my mind yeah and so that's when I first um, made the decision that I needed to be a teacher rather than a doctor this was more important wow. and I needed to discover what this was you know that's amazing because I mean it it's what it's what I see in therapy all the time you know when we're kids and we're growing up we, we just think things are normal you know, we're not we're not supposed to look around at other teenagers and other children and wonder if they're dyslexic or if they mm -hmm. have ADHD or if they have trauma. We just kind of assume everybody's doing what we're doing right. until a big traumatic event or a, uh, an event in general happens that shakes everything up. Right. And I, I think, you know, the... Now, were you a Christian at that? Oh, you, so you had given your life to Christ already and yes. were a Christian. And so how did that kind of help you through your brother's death and... Oh, it was, it was huge. Actually, I went through a, a thing, which is, I mean, this has nothing to do with our topic, but it's important. No, for sure. Um, I think that, um, you know, there was a lot of mystery involved in the way my brother was murdered. There was a lot of, you know, things. One of these days, I'll publish a book I wrote about it, but later on. Um, I think one of the biggest factors that I had to deal with was um, I had, my brother worked for, uh, worked at Burger King. Okay. And the girl called called the house from Burger King, and she's I called her actually to tell her he wasn't coming to work because I had found out you know obviously he was killed and and she goes oh I know he already called in and I was like what <laughs> he called in and she was like yeah he called in and said that he couldn't come in because he was sick. Well, I immediately it really hit me hard because immediately I thought oh my brother lied right before he was killed and so he went to hell. <laughs> that was a big moment for me um, in dealing with that wow. and dealing with, you know, how that went. turns out. It wasn't my brother who made the call. It was the kid that killed him. But, you know, long story short, I had to deal with the, that emotional aspect and that spiritual journey of, you know, walking through God's forgiveness and his grace and the, the timing and, you know, him reading our heart and all of those good things. Yeah. I mean, Another good the podcast. Kid, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, that's yeah. tough. I mean, you know, when you're, it's kind of that question if you're falling off a hill or a cliff and you cuss on the way down, you know, whatever. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. But you think about those things as teenagers because nobody right. really fleshes that out. So, right. yeah, I bet that was super intense. It was a, it was an interesting time just to go through all of that. And I was so fearful of sharing that with my parents because my parents were already having such a traumatic experience from my brother's death. Um, I did not want them to know that this had occurred. So I was, you know, I really internalized it and held on to it and mm. didn't tell anybody, you know, because that was such a big, you know, big thing for me. And uh, anyways, it was interesting that, you know, all of those different changing aspects of what happened in our life um, and how it impacted us. I mean, it, it impacted all of us in a different way. We we're all different people than we were before my brother's murder. Wow. Well, I appreciate you sharing that, that being yeah. vulnerable. Yeah. So how did that lead into, so you decided from then on, like, I'm not going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a teacher. Well, I had to help my sister and my brother because they weren't reading. And it, so it became a passion and you for were me to then? do that. I was 18. Okay. And so it became a passion uh, for me to do that. So I did. I went to school um, to be a, a teacher and to, I really wanted to study about dyslexia. Dyslexia was not very well known at that time. Um, it was just kind of a hidden mm -hmm. uh, disorder and not a, not a lot of people talked about it. And uh, it's just been in the last 20 years that really people have been more open about it. And um, that's come mainly because we've had a lot of actors and actresses and uh, people um, that are in 
in the way um, that know uh, that are popular, I guess. Yeah. That have talked about their dyslexia and that now it's more open. Um, kind of shame reduction around those. Yes. Things. I mean, we've I had a lot so. of that, right? Mental health, right? Dyslexia, dysthymia, all, all the things that I think for years it was like you're you're dumb or you're right. stupid or you're mentally ill or whatever. You know, yeah, we're we're able to see that these are just normal struggles that lots of people have. And I think that's that kind of missed. still I mean, a passion that I have is to help people embrace your differences mm -hmm. and see them as gifts that God's given you and not take them as something bad, but take them as an opportunity to make a change and don't see them as negatives, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, so that's where my passion was. I, I worked in the public school system for 21 years um, as a specialist, a reading specialist, a principal, a teacher, um, basically working with students who had learning differences and helping them to understand that there's nothing wrong with you. You were given a gift that uh, gives you additional challenge. It, it brings up your resilience factor. And um, so that was my passion. Mm -hmm. And I discovered Learning Rx through working with a student. And I had been reading all about the brain and, you know, how you can change the brain and all of those great things. And then I discovered Learning Rx and wanted it in my school system, actually. <laughs> that was a passion. I called them because I wanted it in my school system. And it didn't work out that way. God had another journey for me. And um, so here I am 14 years later, been doing learning arts for 14 years here Wow. Uh, in the area, the only one in the state. And uh, I have just thoroughly enjoyed it. We've had about 1300 graduates who've gone through our system. And um, I mean, I only hear amazing things. I have so many kids from so many different backgrounds, socioeconomic statuses, cultures that come there. Mm -hmm. And I see all the time, you know, I won't even, you know, I won't ask, but they'll say, oh, well, I got it learning, learning RX after this session, mm -hmm. you know, so I have to go work on stuff because I'm ACT prepping or I'm, you know, that's right. other things that yeah. you guys do. Is yeah. It's not just working with people with special needs or, you know, right. issues. It's, it's helping people to excel. Absolutely. You yeah. Know? We have, we have lots of adults who are in the workforce that are in high stress, um, environments that they just need to uh, have a place that they can focus their energies and not be so stressed mm -hmm. because stress does impact your IQ. It does impact your thinking processes. And so if you can learn to manage the stress, uh, like when one girl um, was talking the other day, worked at a doctor's office, um, the amount of volume and things that are happening just was really battering at her. Uh, and it was affecting her emotionally as well. She was having, you know, some emotional things, but it was actually her auditory processing was weak. So she wasn't processing sound. And so every time too many sounds impacted her, then she would start getting into emotional state. Mm. And once she came and she learned to manage her auditory processing, she's thrived in her yeah. job and she's not having the emotional meltdowns. And so that's a big factor. We see that, uh, you know, that's how they, the intelligence goes together with the emotional factor is helping you to manage that. Yeah. Yeah. And y'all have some great assessments for all that to mm -hmm. be able to, you know, kind of piggyback on what we do and go back and forth. So right. I mean, that's been awesome to be able to refer people to y'all. All right. So tell me a little bit about, we're here to talk a little bit about IQ versus EQ. So right. tell me, you know, I think a lot of people have heard of IQ and, uh -huh. e and some emotional intelligence, but for those dummies or myself, let, let's, uh, that are out here, let's talk about that. What is, what is emotional intelligence versus or emotional? What's called, what's the Q in the EQ? Question. Yeah, question Same thing. IQ, yeah. 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 So emotional question is basically taking the, the areas of your emotional uh, register and it's how they're averaged together, how you handle those different emotional registers and they're both your interactive pieces. So you hear a lot about people going, well, I, my Enneagram is, uh, my personality is, my this, my that. And they have all these different factors that they got. Well, all of those different factors kind of make up the EQ. Um, there's specifics to those. Um, and the same is the true with IQ. There's different areas like long-term memory, short-term memory. There's different areas that make up that IQ. So it's basically taking an average of those skill sets and saying, this is your EQ and this is your IQ. And the truth is that they impact each other. And we've saw that more 
than ever before during COVID mm-hmm. uh, because you could see people who uh, were emotionally <clears throat> out of control and it affected their their jobs, their life, their their overall intelligence performance um, to do that. And you see when you look at like the World Economic Forum and some of these that look at job measurements, they're saying that your emotional quotient now is just as important as your intelligence quotient and that they go back and forth hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Your cognitive flexibility, your ability to do that. And so I think that that's probably the biggest factor in between EQ and IQ is your cognitive flexibility. And so that's your ability to transition in a situation uh, and in one factor or the other. Yeah, I mean, when you have, uh, there's so many different ways to look at this. So cognitive flexibility would be your ability to adapt or think on your feet when a situation comes up that you are not prone to handle. Mm -hmm. It's not normally you're in your job description. Um, A colleague is out who normally handles something, all all of a sudden you're dumped into it. And your ability to adapt to that situation is more your cognitive flexibility, both emotional adaptation and intelligent adaptation, being able to take on something that you're not used to doing. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we saw that a lot. We saw that people were all of a sudden out in COVID and you had to adopt to t- adapt to take their job over or you had to cover something or like uh, in my staff, um, everything we do is one to one. And so all of a sudden we had to change from doing one to one delivery to doing virtual delivery. Mm-hmm. And that was a big adaptation uh, that my trainers had to take on. And they weren't used to doing it that way. So their cognitive flexibility became a really big factor in them being successful with that, that transition. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I'm sure as counselors, it was the same type of thing, you know, you had to adapt to talking to someone and trying to gauge their emotion via a screen is very different than trying to do that when you're in person. Yeah, I mean, there's a big argument, you know, not argument, but I guess discussion about telehealth and telemedicine. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and I think as a culture, uh, churches, businesses, therapy, you know, there's been a lot of convenience, quote unquote, in, you know, telehealth. But I'm, I'm kind of pro in, in person connection yeah. um, because I do think that emotional intelligent piece is so important. And yes. when someone's, you know, crying through a screen or grieving through a screen, you can't really connect in the way that you can face to face. Now, if that's all you can do and that's limited, oh, sure. it's a heck of a, be- a lot better than nothing. Right. And, I, you know, it's, it was fantastic that we could keep our jobs and, and make some income and help mm-hmm. people and keep people stable, you know, through the weeks of this last, you know, year of pandemic. Um, but I think the error we kind of make a little bit is saying, well, that it's enough, yeah. you know, or that we should stay here cause it's convenient. And right. I've heard a lot of businesses, you know, well, just stay working from home. Cause I mean, you know, it doesn't matter. Let's just do everything through telehealth. Right. And I always say like you met number one, you miss the connective piece of literally just being in the room with people and sure. the endorphins and the connections and all those things that I think God, are God given. But also like, I mean, you're having a meeting on zoom versus at Rhino coffee here in town, mm-hmm. you know, you're going to you're going to miss connections, people that know them, people that know you, you know, things that God is lining up in your life that in your living room or in your, you know, your bedroom on a screen is not going to do. And that's the truth. I mean, we know (laughs) from brain training that the social connection is so important, even more important for the senior brain than any other age, but extremely important for everybody. But that actually the endorphins in the way that they actually impact the connective tissue or the glial cell Mm -hmm. in the brain is actually phenomenal. So we have good research about that. We have good data that shows that that one to one connection or interconnectivity is a significant difference from the impact via a computer or virtual. Do you think that I mean, the glial uh, cells, what you said? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think that has a have you seen that in teenagers with social media? And I mean, that's gotta be a huge problem. Yeah. So the glial cell is basically your connective cell and it relies on your social connections and basically builds because it connects other cells together. Mm -hmm. And the rapidity of the movement is done because of that interactive. Um, So you'll see those who are more interactive, more social, um, that their glial cells are continually active Mm -hmm. and that they have a higher myelin sheathing 
thing than you see in those that that don't um, have that connection. And what's a myelin sheath? The myelin sheath is basically your protective coating that's on the outside of your cells. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very important to, uh, it's kind of like a, kind of like on a cord, the outer coating. Right. You have all of this, but this outer coating is what kind of keeps it all protected and safe. And it's really important to have that because that helps from erosion. It keeps um, the connections more solid, right. more stable. And why do we need those connections so solid and so stable? Um, because you use them more often. Mm -hmm. And so you use them more often when they're connected and stable and there's more uh, activity in that line right. um, because it's considered a more stable line. Sort of like a, you would be more prone to go across a bridge in your car that is a, uh, a metal bridge that, you know, was formed than you would on a, a bridge that's made out of rope. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You're kind of like, I'm not sure I'm driving my car across that thing. Right. You know, I might walk across it, but I would not, you know, drive my car across it. That's kind of the same thing. And so the brain reads those uh, connections to be whether those are solid, stable connections that I want to send information along or I don't. Right. And, and, and that impacts your emotional quotient and your intelligence right. quotient. Right, yeah. And so how those wire together is basically the more information. So if you bring up any topic and I have some some connection to that topic, then I'm more comfortable talking about that topic than if you bring up something I have no idea about. I mean, I somebody posted the other day on, you know, what topic could you be an expert on? And I was like, oh, I can talk about anything. Just give me anything. Well, that's not really true. <laughs> you, know, you, could, you could talk I, about I it. I could talk about yeah. it, but not with authority yeah. or, you know, really know, know what that is, mm -hmm. you know. And I think that the more that we know about it, the more comfortable that we are talking about that and the more advantageous the information that we have forms connections with other people. Yeah, because the better we communicate it, the more confident and relaxed we are in communicating mm -hmm. it, which mm -hmm. then puts the other person, you know, at ease and mm -hmm. they can learn when they're at ease because they feel safe and the brain functions that way. Right. That's awesome. I mean, you know, I love talking to you about this stuff because it's just, I'm a nerd and so I enjoy thinking <laughs> about it. So yeah, so just to summarize for people out there that are listening, if you're not connecting with human beings and you're just texting or you're just looking through a screen, it limits the connections. It doesn't give you what you need to make your intelligence and your emotional intelligence fire in the best proper ways, which then limits connection, which starts the whole negative cycle again. Right. It, there, there's a famous saying one of my friends put together, uh, uh, Christine Ledbetter. She said, uh, when the neurons uh, fire together, they wire together. Right. And so, you know, when you when you're firing at the same time and those things are firing, then you make you make more of a firm connection. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the neurons that don't sync don't link. And so if you're not syncing, then you don't link. And so one of the things that we miss a lot of times through texting is an actual, you know, view, a facial connection, uh, the realness. I mean, the reason why we do these podcasts in person versus over a phone. I mean, I've done plenty of interviews for radio over the phone, and it's a whole different connection for yeah. me than it is if I'm in the room with the person. When they're doing, and you can just feel that energy and that connection mm -hmm. because it does give that that to you. And it does fire up, as you say, the endorphins and the different parts of your body. It makes those connections in the brain fire harder and um, smarter. And so that's, that's so important, you know? Yeah, it is. Have you ever heard of methyl, the neurochemistry? Yeah. So there's a saying, never hesitate to methylate. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you methylate, your brain heals and it mm -hmm. connects and it, it does this kind of self soothing problem and, right. and can heal trauma. And one of the ways you do that is personal connection, having right. coffee with somebody, green vegetables, exercising, right. serving other people, which mm -hmm. is a surprise to a lot of people. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's awesome. Okay. So, in, in, in your new kind of push for emotional intelligence, what, what are some things that you offer at Learning RX where people could come in and work so, through that? So we do, we do look at the cognitive uh, functions because those are, those are priority at Learning RX is for us to look and see where those are. But we also have you integrate those uh, things with emotional connections. So we give you activities that force you to do those emotional connections. So like if you're, if you're lo looking at reading something, it's reading to someone, reading mm. with someone, even if you're a young child and we say, go home and read to your teddy bear, you know, <laughs> or yeah. whatever like that. That's one of those, those things that you do or you share out 
uh, being able to show yourself proud in a situation. We teach the kids the presidents of the United States as part of their visual listing. And we tell them to go then demo this for your classroom or your Sunday school class or, you know, in a group of people because it l- allows you the moment to shine. Mm-hmm. And the moment to shine is so important for kids who have struggled for so long and haven't had that ability to shine. Yeah. So to give them something that they can do that no one else can do in their classroom gives them that moment to shine. Wow, that's awesome. And that is huge for kids who have been behind the curve for a lot of times. And a lot of times that moment to shine actually drives the need to shine, which drives them to work harder in an area where they've given up. Yeah, because they've never had success. Right. So all they've all they've felt is the shame and disappointment of the failure. And so I was just talking to a client about this this morning that it's part of therapy, right? It's, it's kind of, I love that we parallel what we do, but... It's giving people the first opportunity to feel safe, Mm -hmm. to feel empowered, to to have a conversation that goes well Mm -hmm. because they haven't. Mm -hmm. But then when they try it, they like it and then they want to be vulnerable and and then they can take that and do that in their relationships outside of the room. Right. It gives them good resilience. Yes. I mean, it gives them that, that, that resilience, that bounce back ability where they don't fall and stay down. They fall and get back up. Yeah. When we do EMDR with people, we, we try to find success stories in their life because when we're, we're stuck right in that cognitive distortion of mm. all or nothing thinking then um, we forget the things that we have done but these kids sometimes they don't have a, a memory mm-hmm. a opportunity to go oh yeah I did say the presidents to my friends and they mm-hmm. were like that's awesome or I did learn this song or I did learn this math or I did mm-hmm. you know whatever it is but now they have one right and and we know that that's bored into their brain and right. now it's like man I like that feeling. It was great. And then we have to help, help them, you know, right. culminate that and in a healthy celebrate way. celebrate the successes. Yes, absolutely. Right. And, and I think that's kind of the big factor of the one-to-one and the big factor of celebrating the successes. You have your own personal coach who's constantly celebrating your success. I have one little guy I work with and he's uh, way into Spider-Man. And so when he came, you know, the first time he loved Spider-Man. And, and so I said, well, I'm Wonder Woman. You're Spider-Man. I'm Wonder Woman. So if you win, you get to shoot me with your web. And then if I win, I get to last so you you know and so we're making that connection you know and he's loving that you know it's kind of him being able to show that he's something outside of who he is you know Mm -hmm. and uh so first few sessions i mean it was all about you know i'm gonna be somebody else you know i'm gonna i'm gonna be spider-man and then by his you know third or fourth session he likes the whole Spider-Man thing, but now he has changed the name of Spider-Man to merge it with his own name. And so now it's not Spider-Man now, but it's his name, you know. And he's so that was really cool for yeah, he, he him to be able to integrate his, you know, ability of success to say, you know, now I own this success. It's not Spider-Man that owns the success, but I own this success. And so that was really cool for him to be yeah. able to do that. Yeah, because that's building the emotional intelligence. So mm-hmm. he's... he's you know, for safety reasons, he's projecting this idea of Spider-Man because if, if Spider-Man fails, it's fine. Right. You know, it's but not I'm not going to fail. Yeah. Right. But then once he got the confidence, he's like, well, hold on. I don't want Spider-Man getting the credit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know, I need to get some of this credit because I'm working hard to do it. That's awesome. I yeah. love that. Yeah. And so, you know, he created his own superhero that was his, himself. He's the superhero now. And so for him to be able to do that with only three sessions is incredible. It's because he was seeing that success for himself and he didn't want to give that credit to anybody else. He wanted to take it. Yeah, that's and awesome. that was great. Yeah. So, okay. So IQ, tell me like what, what are the IQ scores and what do those mean? And so an average IQ is kind of in that 90 to hundred range. Mm-hmm. Um, 85 to 110 is kind of the big, big area uh, okay. that we look at that. And a lot of people look at IQ and say, okay, well, if you're below that average, then you're stuck. You're stuck with a learning disability. You're stuck. And honestly, I mean, going to school, I mean, you and I both, probably our education backgrounds, you know, that's kind of the vein of thought has been is that once you have an IQ, you're stuck in that IQ. Mm -hmm. And I love that Learning Rx challenges that and changes IQ because we change the skill set. So IQ is just an average of your long-term memory, your short-term memory, your processing speed. I mean, it's an average of all those skills. Mm -hmm. And if you change that by changing the skill set, then your average goes up. So if your skills go up, your average goes up, therefore your IQ goes up. Right. It's not some fixed thing that you're born with and 
it's like, oh, well, this is as, as dumb as you're going to be forever. Right. Is what it, yeah. But mentally and in school, we were taught that. I mean, <sighs> when I was in school, we were taught, you know, if you had a child who came in with a 70 IQ, they're learning disabled. They're always going to be learning disabled. So you need to give them accommodations, modifications in the classroom and just kind of hop them along because they're never going to be anything more than what they are. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that we challenge that and change that for me is the game changer because That's you're taking huge. a kid or an adult who has always thought that they were here. Like we had a, a, a young man, a 27 year old um, who just came in and he was always in special education, never able to succeed, you know, and put into a place, you know, put into a box. Yeah. And he came in and he was like, I want to challenge this box. I don't want to be in this box anymore. I want to be able to read. I want to be able to write and do these things. And so six months through, you know, a program. And now he is an avid author, a speaker, traveling the world, sharing his successes and how he's changed his life because he could do those things. But he wanted to challenge that. And that was a game changer for him to be able to challenge what he thought was the box that he was stuck in. And now he's not. Yeah, I love that because I know your heart and I also know you love the Lord. So it's such a beautiful kind of picture of the gospel and, and uh, such a parallel. So I'm sure you get it to really sneak is. that in all the time. All the time. How God allows so much from us and our potential is... It's not limited. And I think that's my, my favorite thing about what I do is that the, the potential is always there. Yeah. And you never have to say, I am what I am and I can't be more. Mm -hmm. You can always be more. And that's what God, I mean, that's the whole, whole scripture is all about that is that he is more in you. He's, he's greater, greater is he that's in you than he's in the world. You can be anything. Mm -hmm. And so there's no limit to what you can be. And that's what we tell our kids. You can dream to be anything. I had a mom just recently said her, she brought her daughter and she just wanted her daughter to be able to be happy with where she was at. And she did hated school, didn't want to go to school. And, you know, she started the program six weeks in. We have an eval. We sit and meet with the mom. And the mom sits there and cries. And she says, my daughter, for the first time, and, you know, she's in high school, is now talking about going to college. Mm. Before, she was just talking about if she could just get through this to the dropout age, you know, where she could just drop out. Now she's talking about college. What a change. Well, it's all because now she sees her own potential where before she didn't see her potential. So it impacted her emotional experiences and how she was interacting with people. She was withdrawing from everybody. Well, yeah, because those same neurochemical, I mean, that's where depression and anxiety and, mm -hmm. you know, all those things come from. Right. And they have, I mean, kids have, I've heard it a million times. My wife always tells the story of being in school at a young age and the teacher standing in front of the classroom and holding up a test mm -hmm. and calling her out and tearing the test up or something. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the exact story, but it was a very traumatic event for her. Mm -hmm. And, and she has a really hard time retaining, you know, reading comprehension, things like that and got made fun of or had comments made. Um, I mean, I remember my own stuff in, in high mm -hmm. school and in school, many people have the bullying experience mm -hmm. of, you know, it being an education mm -hmm. issue and it's like, man, it's so fixable, but our, our school system's so broken mm -hmm. and focusing on grades and teaching for the test and, and all these things. And, and yeah, a lot of kids get left behind. And not seeing the whole potential of right. the child, not seeing everything that there is. I, I remember in third grade, um, I was left-handed. And my teacher taped my hand to my desk and to force me to be right-handed because left-handed children have learning disabilities. I remember you telling me this. And I was like, just blown away, humiliated, you know, all that. So I became right-handed because I had to. Right. What's that say about your worth and value and your identity, right? Yeah. The emotional exactly. part. You know, it was just part of that, that thing. And so I've been able to write with both hands, but I didn't want to ever, you know, have to do it. And then I had to have surgery on my right arm and I couldn't write with my right arm. And, and I began to write with my left arm again. And I'm like, Oh, I can do this and there's nothing wrong with this, you know, <laughs> that's such a mental thing, you know? And so, you know, I, I, I do both now. I, I write with, you know, both hands or, you know, do things with both hands and, 
And I don't think about it now because I overcame that emotional part, emotional part of yeah. that, which is crazy that I had that, you know, but it was put on me by somebody and I accepted it, Yeah, you know, because culturally it was not appropriate to be a left handed. You know? Well, it wasn't crazy at all. Yeah. Right. I mean, it wasn't a rash. Your feelings about it. I think, you know, this is something I would want people to understand is when you go through something that's a significant trauma, whether it's about learning or whether it's about who you can be mm -hmm. or writing with your left hand or mm -hmm. an experience, um, you, you cope by surviving as a right. child and you don't know that the adults are wrong. You don't mm -hmm. know that the system's broken. You don't mm -hmm. know that you should be pushing back and you can't. Mm -hmm. So you adapt to survive. Mm -hmm. And then later in life, those same adaptations seem crazy mm -hmm. in a safe environment. Right. But you don't realize that it's not at the so, time. You know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When you're going through it, you just think this is the whole world and this is the mass of, you know, what I'm stuck under. Yeah. And, and then and then later you're, again, shaming yourself for having these coping mechanisms that helped you survive. Right. Now, that doesn't mean we stick those coping. Right. Now yeah. you write with both hands and right. you do things differently. Right. But it's that emotional part that that trauma, that shame, that grief, that anxiety that causes you to not be able to function on the intelligent side. So I love how you're you're weaving those two things together. I think it's just so amazing to watch how the resilience grows and um, you, you know, said resilience a couple of times. So t say what is resiliency to you well, when you're saying resilience? So building someone's resiliency. Um, basically, their ability to get back up um, no matter what hits them. And so that's building the skill set that allows you to be hit, be knocked down, and to jump back up yeah. from that. And to understand that failure is only a part of the process and it doesn't define you. Yeah. And I think that that's so important um, for kids to get because um, that factor, that growth mindset is such a game changer when you understand that this is just a piece of the growing process for you and it's not defining you forever is super powerful mm -hmm. and whether that's you know in you know through counseling or through you know actually working through the cognitive function working through i mean <laughs> A math. You hate math. You know, you think math is the devil itself and you can't do math and you say, I can't do math and this is the way it is. But it's so powerful when you can go and say, you know, I hate math, but I can do math. Mm -hmm. I had a little boy recently and he came in. Oh, you know, math was just horrible. And after a few weeks, then he then I said, well, Cameron, what makes the big difference for you for math? And he said, well, I have a calculator in my brain now. <laughs> you know, awesome. all of a sudden, that's a whole different mindset than what he had before and um, you know when I first went to learning Rex and you know as a franchisee I had to go through the training itself I had through life adapted I had a visual processing issue I had glasses contacts you know surgeries whatever but I had developed a visual processing issue mine affected me where I didn't understand north south east west so you told me turn right by Burger King I got it but if you said turn turn north on something you know where do I turn you know it really I didn't have the compass in my brain and so for me to retrain that area of my brain was powerful because then all of a sudden I could know instantly where to turn and it wasn't something that traumatized me like before gave me my husband's one of those people he's a game warden so you know you could drop him off in the woods in the middle of Timbuktu and he could find his self home in an hour you know <laughs> I would just sit down and cry by a tree you know right. forget it but I'm not that way anymore and so to be able to do that as an adult was super powerful for me and uh, to be able to say okay well this was where I had two master's degrees I mean I it wasn't that I had a lack of education. I had just embraced that deficit as just being who I was. Mm -hmm. And instead yeah, and of, that's when it trickles into that emotional yeah, part, right? Yeah, instead of challenging it, you know, I had accepted that as part of my identity. Instead of saying, no, I don't have to do that. And I think that's what I love about what we do is that you don't have to accept failure as a part of your identity. You can make change. And you just have to want to. Yeah. And finding the want to to do that and finding the empowerment to do that is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. Okay. So what should, um, like why, why is it important for our community to know about this and to do something about it? And what would you say um, is the biggest impact? Well, I mean, personally, my passion would be that every single person in our community get a cognitive assessment and know where your weaknesses are. I think there's no excuse. I mean, you go and get your eyes checked, your teeth checked, your hearing checked. 
you need to get your brain checked. Absolutely. Okay. And I think you need to understand where you are. I think everybody should have that moment uh, where you actually understand where your own strengths and weaknesses are and that you can do something about it and that you can do that whether you do it at home or with a personal trainer or what you do. But there are ways to change the way you think. Yeah, I think, you know, I see this a lot with therapy, with what you do, with diet, with whatever mm-hmm. it is, mm-hmm. is that we're we're terrified to look at it because if we look at it, we're going to know, and then we have to do something about it. Right. And, and so it, that, that's the truth. Yeah, I mean, no, you know? for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. But the reality is, is that if, um, if we don't look at it, then we don't get better. We don't heal. We don't grow. And so with our marriages, with our parenting, with our, our emotional intelligence, our IQ, yeah, I think the assessment part is huge and, um, is easy and not, you know, I came over there and did some of the testing and, mm-hmm. and, you know, I felt really encouraged afterwards. I know I still need to take the other test and I need to get on that. <laughs> uh, like you're saying, you, I need to go to the dentist too, but you know, you put things off. Yeah. Um, but the reality is, is yeah, I, th- I hope people listening to this can push past that. You know, if they're, if they're working right now and struggling with something or they're looking for a new job or man, I mean, so many things are changing in our culture. Right. Uh, right now where people I, I met with somebody earlier wanted to change out of their job to another one and they're scared because you know I don't want to go back to school I can't do that again you know I'm old I've, I've missed out on blah 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 it's like yeah well go get an assessment mm-hmm. figure out where you are you know yeah. take a little bit of time and investment in yourself so that right. you can build that up right and I, I think that's the powerful piece I think that the fact that you can I mean I mentioned you know that I had had surgery er- earlier but I I had had a really traumatic time in 2018 where um, I actually had a minor procedure that ended up going septic, um, you know, in the hospital eight months. And um, I had so many procedures, you know, ended up with a bowel resection. I had so many procedures that it affected the way that my thought processes. Mm -hmm. And I had to do brain training. I own the place. (laughs) But I had to do brain training to get my skill set back just because... I could feel the fuzz. I could feel the foggy, uh, fogginess happening. And so embracing that and saying, you know, I need to do this for myself is powerful and it's game changing, you know, for you to be able to do that. Just like you have to talk through the trauma of going through all of that. You know, that's the emotional aspect. You have to talk through that trauma. You can't just accept that you went through this and you're angry that you had to go through. You had to talk through that, um, you know, and get through that experience, whether that's with, a, you know, a professional counselor or, you know, a person that you're working with or a, a pastor or whoever it is. You have to talk through that and get through that, um, you know, journal, read, you know, go to the Lord about it. You have to get through that because it is a mental exercise that affects you emotionally and it affects affects your cognitive ability Mm -hmm. and so both of those things are so integrated and so important and I think that's the biggest factor of the one-to-one is because you have someone that you're talking through and who's coaching coaching you through those experiences coaching you through that I want to give up phase and okay let's just try this one more time you know let's let's get through this I bet you can do this if you gave it 10% more effort, you know, Mm -hmm. and let's just try it, you know, and if you fell, it's okay. Falling down is okay. I'm right here to help you get back up, you know, and I think that's super powerful. Yeah. I mean, that builds that resiliency, you know, Mm -hmm. is to see that you fall down and you get back up and you fall down and you get back up and and then you get better and you get better and you get better. We, my oldest takes violin and um, he has to practice every day and, you know, and the songs are hard and Mm -hmm. he has to learn them. And so we go back to Hey, you remember when Twinkle was hard mm-hmm. and you didn't want to do it? And, you know, you just, but he, then they have these experiences of success. Right. But that doesn't mean the next time it's hard, you don't want to quit sometimes. Right. But now you have a, a moment and a neuro pathway that goes, no, this feels good. You can push through it. It actually feels better if you earn it. Yeah. You know, we're the same way with like toys. So we have this little thing we do where we cut out. He wants something that's kind of expensive and we'll cut out. Uh, I'll print it out on the printer and then I'll cut it into like 40 pieces. And then if I catch him doing good, if I catch him loving on his brother, being kind or, you know, praying or doing whatever it is that is positive, cleaning something up, um, I'll give him a piece, you know, Mm -hmm. and then he'll build it and earn it. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's always way more happy and plays with that toy way more than the ones that like, you know, his grandparents give him or, you know, 
Yeah. Unless it's like the awesome ones, but you know, for the most part. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we always like earned things. I mean, it's such yes. a, it's such a good thing and earns just has more value to us because we had to work hard for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's a factor. Well, we're and seeing we'll that currently in the job market, right? Well, it's like, are. there's so many people, there's so many jobs open, but unfortunately people are getting, you know, help and that's great, but mm -hmm. there's this tension of, right. You know, do you get help and, and feel empowered? Mm -hmm. Or do you get help and stay stuck because now you're just getting it. And when this runs out, where's where, where that going to leave us? And For I know sure. there's people on both sides of that. I'm not saying everybody's just taking handouts, but there's something about earning it yourself and then being able to, you know, accomplish something that gives you value. And, and, it, and it gives you so much value to understand that. And children need to learn that from a very young age. They need to earn, earn you know, that, that's a, that's a factor that, that, that give me and don't, don't just give it to me. And, and I think that that factor in and of itself affects the brain in, in the intelligence. It does affect, you know, we know in the logic and reasoning that it affects their, um, abstract concrete, uh, aspect. We see that a yeah. lot, um, of people who come in and they have no absolutes and that's a struggle when you have no absolutes. I mean, you have nothing to, um, to center on, to focus on, mm -hmm. and you have to find that absolute for yourself, um, you know, where, where you can focus. Uh, you know, I think that's so interesting in the sense that, I mean, I'm sure you, just as I have in the last 10 to 14 years, have seen that huge shift from technology, from culture, from the teen culture, from parents, um, like learning and prefrontal development and all those mm -hmm. things are so getting extended out to 27, 28, meaning... They, they're not thinking like adults. They're not being mature. Right. Um, and so we kind of do this ageist thing where we're like, oh, the millennials are just this mm -hmm. way. And it's like, well, we've kind of created this with our, have. you know, and t total entitlement culture, immediate gratification. Everything is built on dopamine hits mm -hmm. instead of serotonin. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like everything is I get what I want right now. I don't have to wait. I don't have to earn it. Mm -hmm. And I get the best of it, mm -hmm. you know, for the for a large majority of people. I'm not saying that's for everybody. Um, but there's very little earning, which gives you serotonin, mm -hmm. you know, serotonin, I think hits what, like 15 receptors and Absolutely. dopamine hits like four, right? Dopamine super addictive and you need more and more and more of it. Right. And serotonin is enriching and lasts forever, you know, right. a long time, but connecting and doing this gives us serotonin. Right. We're watching a five minute video of a cat. Right. And, and that's it. And that's the reason why our kids are so addicted to the cell phone is mm -hmm. because, you know, of that they're getting the dopamine. Um, you know, constantly that, you know, and they're not getting the serotonin connection and, and that goes with their video gaming when they're gaming and they're, but, but that's also affecting attention. And so we have, you know, such a huge, uh, problem with attention rises. Um, like Louisiana is the number one state for, um, prescriptions for ADD medication. Mm -hmm. We're not the number one state in population so why do we have so much of this or is it because we're over prescribing or is it because of what we're doing we need to both. be yeah, <laughs> yeah both yeah so we need to be doing something about that on the attention factor and we need to be pulling back i tell parents all the time you know no media an hour before bed you know you got to pull that completely off and um, when you're not doing any media an hour before bed that you need to be reading out loud, no matter how old your child is, you know, that needs to be happening. And we don't see enough of that. We don't see enough of that interaction in between the parent and the child, right as they're going to bed, right as they're getting ready for, you know, the end of the day and, and that procedure. That's really, really important. And parents don't realize they're so busy that they don't realize how important that is. And it's easier. I'm cleaning up the kitchen. I'm doing, you know, whatever I'm doing. And you need to just go, you know, just you can watch a movie before you go to bed, you mm -hmm. know, and that's the easy thing, but it's the incorrect thing and it's causing problems in the attention factor. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, you know, it's that just constant need for um, escapism too. Mm -hmm. you know, it's not being present. It's not staying connected. It's, mm -hmm. it's thinking you're connected. You're texting mm -hmm. people, you're Snapchatting with people, you're TikToking with people, right. but it's not giving your brain the same chemistry and the same connections right. that that other stuff is. And I think that's the thing that I love about you being on here and talking about this because that's the education piece that's missing is right. they don't, people don't see that. Although it feels like it's connecting, mm -hmm. it's literally turning to completely different parts of your brain on. Right. 
which, you know, there's not any in between. It's mm -hmm. either building these things up and building resiliency or it's not. Well, and the crazy thing is how it affects our long-term memory focus. So we see a lot of kiddos and, uh, and adults right now that their long-term memory is actually turning down mm -hmm. instead of turning up. And, um, they were like, well, why, why am I not learning to, why am I not learning to encode things? Because you're looking at things that are only partial. You have no experience with it. You're just seeing it. And so there's no connection in the brain with, with that. You're not making an actual, uh, interactional, uh, connection in the brain. So it makes it very difficult if you're only experiencing with one sense mm -hmm. vision. Um, one sense is experiencing and nothing else is. And so you're not making a lasting impression in the brain. It's a subtle impression. Yeah. Um, and so then you don't understand or interpret that same thing. When you see it again, you don't make that connection with it. And so you see that a lot. Um, Long-term memory is the number one reason kids end up in special education is because they're not, why do we have a rise in our special education population? We have a rise on how we're abusing technology. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to see that rise happening because you're not encoding the schema with those ex experiential data that yeah, needs I, to be done. I love that you said abusing technology because that's such a good way of looking at it. You know, it's, it's the technology in and of itself isn't bad, just like a gun isn't of itself bad. Right. But the reality is, is when we use them inappropriately and they're accessible for everybody and they're laying around our house and nobody's monitoring them, nobody's protecting them, there's no rules about them, just mm -hmm. like with a gun, mm -hmm. somebody's going to get shot. Right. And the reality is, is that the kids nowadays, you know, they, they are in charge of their screen time. Mm hmm you know, I think the stat is, you know, 83% of parents have, have no rules for devices. Right. You know, I talk about this a lot with pornography and sexual trauma and abuse, and we could go on a tangent about that. We'll stick to it. But just from the just practical neuroscience aspect of it, um, I know it's cheesy and cliche to say screen time's bad, but it's like, it's not just bad. It's awful. Right. You yeah. Know, it's so when, when abused. When abused. And it's yeah. so easy to abuse it. I think that's the key point is like when people are like, well, how long should they get? And I'm like you know, 30 minutes, maybe, you know, like it's actually 10 minutes times the age of the child. Right. So that's the number of streaming media. That's what's uh, recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And that's the data information. But you have to take into account of what that child can handle. Say your individual child. Yeah, yeah, your individual child can handle in a mass depending on how you're doing and what type of media is it? Um, that's a big factor of it. I mean, if you're dedicating all of your 10 minutes times the age of the child to TikTok, then you're really not getting the value out of the system that you should be getting. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be a data source that you get. And, um, you know, we can get into all the dietary aspects and all that, but that's not really, you know, the best place for us to be donating or talking about right now, even though that's really important. Um, it's more important for us to look at that and say, okay, if I'm donating my child's nine and I'm getting an hour and a half of, of media, where is that media coming from? And what kind, what am I doing with that media? Mm -hmm. Is it something that I'm absorbing the information and I'm learning something new in that information or am I wasting that time? Yeah. And that's a big factor. And we see it's hitting a lot of marriages because Ooh. you're in families that, Absolutely. you know, restaurants sitting there and everybody's on their phone or, you know, there's good ways to use media and there's poor ways to use media. And you have to remember that not to let the media use you, but you use the media. Yeah. And I would say that's a challenge because it's almost impossible. You know, what I mean is, is that even, even as good as we try to be technology, certain parts of the technology, let's say social media or gaming, they're going to win mm -hmm. the more you expose yourself to it. Well, yeah, because, because it's addictive. Yeah, and because you're <laughs> neurology. I mean, you're a caveman. Yeah. You know, we still somewhat have the same brain we've had for thousands of right. years, and now we have this algorithm and this thing that is more addictive than cocaine. Right. And we can't win. I mean, I, I do that all the time. I know all this, and then still find myself, you know, every once in a while, looking up 30 minutes on some stupid video that I was, you know, I was supposed to read something that I wanted to read, and now I'm, you know, have looked at dumb five minute videos for 30 minutes, and I'm like, what am I doing? Yeah, but so it sucks I, you in. I had a lady last night. She said, uh, I just went and bought 30 books. And then I found myself not re I read one page and then I was, you know, on my phone, you know, 
And she, I was like, your phone just needs to go into a different room. I yeah. mean, you, if, if you're, it's that much of addiction, put it away from you and sit down and take your time to do that because it does, it refreshes your brain and yeah, you, know, you got to get it out of the room aspect. You've got to get it away from you. It's like a, it's like a, um, somebody described it as like this, uh, magical item that's just yelling at you. So, you know, it's like a, you know, the sentient sword that, you know, talks to you or whatever in cartoons, but it, you, know, you put your phone over there. It's like, Hey, Hey. Hey, and if you have it on vibrate and it's like, womp, womp, you know, or crickets it's connected or whatever. to your phone, it's oh, connected man, to your yeah. watch. Don't or, get know, me started like on smart watches. <laughs> Don't get me yeah. on that tangent. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying they're in and of themselves bad, but my goodness, you yeah. know, when you're in therapy sessions and people are reading their text messages while you're doing therapy, it's like you're, you're, you're take, you're disconnecting. Yes, exactly. And, and you're learning bad. And so for adults, that's terrible, but for kids, it's extremely terrible because right, we're making the biggest connections to synapses and, and all these things. And, uh, and they're, you know, where maybe me and you, when we were kids, we'd watch cartoons, right? Mm -hmm. Saturday morning. We were laughing about this this weekend or last night at jujitsu. We were talking about Saturday morning cartoons and, number one the quality of them but also like the oh you get up you get cereal you watch cartoons but it was like you know you watch about 15 minutes and then you get a commercial mm -hmm. well now on youtube or youtube kids or whatever you watch about five minutes and you get a commercial mm -hmm. and you're watching more and more and more of it and so your brain's getting used to paying attention for five minutes and then right. taking a break right and it, i think it's the same way with checking our phones i mean it's totally normal for a young adult to be in a meeting like this and to pick their phone up and, te and te check it and text someone else while they're talking to you. Well, and it's crazy that, you know, recently they, they just without said, saying, hold on one second, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They said the uh, American attention span is now less than a goldfish. <laughs> That's a cracker really or scary. a real goldfish. <laughs> yeah, <a> real goldfish. <laughs> yeah, goldfish has more attention um, because it's really short. There's like four second, uh, four second attention span. Really, four seconds. That's really short. If you think about that, I mean, that's incredibly short. Four seconds. That's uh, and mind yet we boggling. think we multitask well. Yeah, and there's not such a thing. I tell parents all the time. You know, simultaneous processing does not happen. You have to task switch. And the better you are at task switching, the better it seems like you're multitasking. But you actually, the brain cannot do that. It cannot simultaneously process. Mm -hmm. So your task switching ability is something that we work on for those who struggle with that ability. But more and more, we see that that selective attention factor is being uh, impacted like nobody's business. And so you don't have the sustained attention. When we do an activity where we call it a attention rotate, where we actually measure that um, just a simple staring contest you would be blown away at how many people just get into a staring contest I mean literally for two seconds three mm -hmm. seconds is all they can because they have to look away at something or look down or you know they just can't stand that the eye connection yeah and that's okay so that's another kind of dual emotional intelligence right. IQ thing because one is because of their neurology and their lack of attention and their attention deficit. Right. But also the other is we have a really hard time being vulnerable and connecting and looking eye to eye. That's right. And it's amazing how many people will not look you in the face anymore, will look mm -hmm. down, you know, and, and there's this just uncomfortability of being connected. And I mean, that's, that's a huge thing we're seeing in, you know, the 17, 18, the juniors and seniors in high school and the young adults in college is yeah. that they, I mean, I have parents in here all the time, email me, call me, and I hear it from other of my peers, but like, they won't call the doctor. Mm -hmm. They won't make a dentist appointment. Mm -hmm. They're like, nope, I can't do that. I'm gonna have a panic attack if mm -hmm. I have to, and like literal panic attack, like mm -hmm. not a dramatic, I'm going to panic, but mm -hmm. like they're having anxiety to the point of needing medication because they can't socially interact with people. Yeah. And we see that too. I no, mean, we I see that that's, that's, that's a major uh, uh, impact on their cognitive function. Their emotional aspect creates high anxiety. And that high anxiety then pours over into the way that they're performing in the classroom and how their cognitive function is being interpreted. And once you take that away, that anxiety piece away by giving them that confidence, then their interaction phase goes mm -hmm. up and that social interaction, then the brain grows. And so that's why the EQ and the IQ are so important to each other and how they feed into each other is because 
your intelligence can affect your emotions and your emotions can affect your intelligence and it goes back and forth in so many different factors we see how trauma you know feeds over to the impact of the child in the classroom mm -hmm. um or the adult in life you know and how they're doing going back and thinking you know about how things impact you in the classroom or impact your life your choices that you make a lot of it is emotion affecting your your intelligence or intelligence affecting your emotions mm -hmm. I mean, it's a factor that goes back and forth mm -hmm. and anxiety is the biggest factor i think that we see now more than ever before with uh, with the COVID. yeah uh, i do see a lot of that a lot of um i just can't manage uh feeling a lost feeling yeah well, you know, for those people listening, like I want to encourage you that if you're sitting here and you're overwhelmed with the aspect of doing it, I've been to Learning RX. It's amazing. I love working with Denise. So the people that are over there are super sweet. It's a very easy, gentle, shame reducing thing to do. So if you have that in your city, in your town, if you want to start one, if you're like, this is awesome, I have never thought of this or never saw the impact. Um, Denisa would love to talk to you about that and connect sure. with you. If you're in town, if you're in Shreveport and Bossier or, or in an area that has a learning RX or something similar, uh, please reach out. But I will say like, she sent me the test to take and I love this stuff and I still haven't made the time to do it. So it's just like, like we said, brushing your teeth, exercising therapy. Life is about striving for balance, but not finding it. I mm -hmm. think so many people say, well, you need to have a balanced life. Your EQ and your IQ need to be balanced. And it's like, well, that would be ideal. Mm hmm but we're all working towards it. That's and right. so we have areas where maybe we're not eating great right this second, or maybe we're working out well, but we're not dealing with our emotions, or maybe we're dealing with our emotions really well and in therapy, but we let ourselves go a little bit in other departments. You know, try not to shame yourself. Try to just strive for that balance. So the, ho the hope of this podcast is to kind of tweak your ears and go, oh man, yeah, I didn't even know this existed. I didn't even know this was impacting me, but now that I've heard it, maybe my kid needs to go and check in. Maybe I want to go and check in. I mean, even now I'm like fired up to take this test after I get off here because I'm like, yes, I need to check in on this for myself because I want to be the best version of me possible right? so that I can serve other people, love other people, be a good father, be a good husband, be a good therapist. It's 35 minutes of your time. All right. I mean, 35 minutes and you can see where your, your overall functionality is and you can embrace that to say, this is what I need to improve. This is an area that I can deliberately work on. And sometimes it actually is a, such an aha moment. Mm -hmm. I know something is wrong but I cannot figure out what it is. And so I can take this test and it says, oh, well, you're weak in this area. Now I can jump on this and embrace this and address this and feel like I can accomplish and get out of that cycle of feeling like something's wrong and I can't figure out what it is. Mm -hmm. um, I see a lot of that in spousal issues. I had a, a, a wife uh, recently and she brought her husband in and she was just like, he's driving me crazy. I think he's going through dementia. And I'm like, he's 30. And she was just like, I really think he's having dementia. Well, it wasn't so much that, it's that he wasn't attuned to details. Um, because that wasn't his skill set. Mm -hmm. And so once he was able to train that area and be attuned to details, it was like a whole new, you know, marriage experience, yeah. you know, because now he, when she's coming home late at night, he turned the lights on. And that was a factor. It was a really big deal to her, but he just forgot. He just forgot to do it constantly, mm -hmm. you know, and once he could remember to do it, it was a game changer, small thing. Big impact. Oh, absolutely. So, yeah, because that, I mean, that, that, that's taking the intentions out of it, right? It's like right. a lot of people don't, don't intend to do what they're doing, but right. they've never tuned in to that, figure out why it is, right? Yeah. They never ask yeah. why, like we're talking about, right. you know, like why it is that we have these problems and these deficits. Um, and then that allows the other people to understand it and then have empathy and grace and mercy for us in our, because right. we all have the deficits. Yeah, you know? for sure. I mean, everybody has strengths and weaknesses. Just know yours. I yeah. mean, that's the thing. That's the power is you have the power to know yours and whether you do anything to address it or not, at least, you know, it, mm -hmm. you know, when your eyesight's going bad and you go to the doctor and you say, yeah, you need glasses, you know, that that's a game changer. Get your glasses and, and, and move on. You know, um, you know, I, I just had gallbladder surgery. I knew something was wrong. I was nauseous all the time. I didn't know, you know what it was game changer, dude. <laughs> like 
it is a game changer. I had mm. gallbladder surgery the next day. All this nausea and stuff I've been fighting for years is gone. It's amazing how uncomfortable sending something without an answer, right? Yeah. And I was just in, you know, thinking that was just my new normal, you know, just I was aging and, you know. Oh, man, we grin and bear so, so many things that without resources right. make us miserable. Right. Yeah. I mean, I love to see the look on people's faces whenever, you know, we talk about trauma or we talk about, you know, anxiety or we, you know, we talk about these internal things and the light bulb clicks on and they're like, man, I wish I'd been therapy 10 years ago, you know, or 15 right. years ago. Or, right. Yeah. I, I mean. Don't we all? Yeah, for sure. And, and that's, I think for me being a brain trainer, I enjoy the experience. I mean, I, I do a lot of consulting with the parents and stuff like that, but I always train at least one or two students right now. I have three, um, just because I love it. Mm -hmm. It's so fun to watch the change in a child's life or an adult's life and them to embrace that change for themselves and, and see their own potential. Yeah. Everybody's been asking me like, are you going to start moving to just doing the podcast and doing talks and not doing therapy? And I'm like, no, <laughs> like, I mean, I gotta keep doing therapy. I love it so much. You yeah. know, and I might not do as much in the future, but yeah, I'm like you, I gotta, I like to, Number one, have the pulse of where we're at and where right. people are and keep those skills sharp so that it transitions well into education and right. into prevention and the stuff we're doing. So yeah. um, any closing kind of big ticket items you want to cover or talk about or want everybody to know? I, I think the biggest thing um, that I would like everybody to know is just to know that you are you can be anybody that you want to be. There is no limitations to what you can do. And um, stop allowing those limitations in your life. Um, start embracing the fact that you can do more and um, be open to that. Mm -hmm. um, don't let that be a burden because some people say, oh, I can do more and I'm not doing more. And that becomes their burden. Don't let it be a burden to you. But falling down doesn't mean you have to stay down. That's right. And you can get up. And there's resources in our community, so many resources in our community. And... Um, if you don't know where they are, contact us. Let us point you to the right direction. If Learning Rx is not the right direction for you, there is someone else I can point you to, mm -hmm. you know, or, or, or you can point to. Yeah. You know, there are resources in our community. We're very blessed in our community. And there's so many people that care. And that's one of the things I love about Shreveport Bossier. Uh, little small town, but a large town, yeah. you know. And um, there's so many caring people here in so many different aspects yeah so. well thank you so much for coming on this has been awesome Thanks. i'm always pleased to talk with you and hear just your brilliance and your care for people and your kindness um you know it, it's a resource that people don't i mean a lot of people do know but a lot of people don't know and i hope that by being on the podcast that you know number one you get more clients and more love and more support but also um that you're just able to get you know the things you need um if you're out there and you're listening you're not in treeport bozier and you, you're like, man, this all sounds good, but we don't have this in our area. Please contact us, find some resources, figure out how we can connect you to somebody in your area so that you can get the help you need. Um, so your emotional intelligence and your IQ can, you know, dance together and you can have a successful, beneficial, peaceful life. And we virtually train now. So oh, awesome. you can do that no matter where we have students all over the world. That's awesome. So I you didn't can know that get part. virtual training, brain training, no matter where you're at. Awesome. Okay. So if you need something, contact Denisa. Do you all have a Facebook page and Instagram? We do. Instagram? We have a great Facebook page, Instagram, yep. website. So what, what yeah. are they, is it just Learning RX? Is Learning that? RX Shreveport. Okay. Yeah. Learning RX Shreveport. Uh, of course, there's Learning RX, you know, national. Uh, Brain RX is the international brand. So we have international branches, national branches. Um, we're all over the country. Um, there's there's Learning RX systems all over the country. There's even private practice individuals who do it if there's not a full franchise in the area. Awesome. Um, so there's some medical personnel who do it. You, yeah. So if you're it, the thing I challenge you to is if you have a doctor or a therapist, you know, maybe check in with a learning RX and, and get that assessment and let them integrate that into what you're doing in other areas of your life to get healthy. Because sure. I know we do that here and we're able to collaborate if there's a kid or a, a person who needs it. So, um, thank you. Episode 29 is done um please subscribe on youtube please um you know listen to it wherever you listen to it give it a review uh leave some comments so we know what we can do better um the next couple of weeks i'm going to be doing some teaching on here um and doing some q a from the public so if you have a, a question or a topic that you'd love for me to cover uh please email us at clintdaviscounseling at gmail.com go to our website um, and you can get in touch with us and just email in if you wanted some topics like this or some questions answered and you're asking why about something and you're like, man, 
you know, I'm hearing all these discussions, I'm listening to videos and podcasts, but they, I feel like they're missing this or they're not addressing this. Um, man, email me, I'll, I'll get somebody on it and we'll cover it. Uh, thank y'all and God bless Denise. And thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Absolutely.